Thanks, Bola. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, I'm going to continue with the same theme that you heard from David at uh, Simpromix when I talk about 4D molecular. If we think about all modern therapeutic modalities today, they're all by definition targeted, right? Whether it's antibodies, ADCs, CAR Ts, they're all targeted. But if you think about it, to date, gene therapies that are being developed and commercialized are not yet targeted. They use naturally occurring AV vectors that are present in nature and are really not targeted or pharmaceutical grade. So at 4D, we aim to change that and take the, this, uh, this platform of gene therapy to the next level. So there are really four main pillars of our value proposition. The first is our discovery platform, which really differentiates us from the rest of AV gene therapy companies. We can come up with highly customized uh, proprietary vectors for any uh, set of diseases in the body. Any, uh, we are able to target any set of uh, cells or tissues in the body using the optimal clinical route of administration. Number two is our pipeline. We have a di differentiated pipeline. Ophthalmology, we have an exclusive partnership with Roche, who will do phase three in globalization. We do all the early stage development in that collaboration. We also have the rights to develop our own products under that uh, collaboration. Uh, thirdly is our partnerships. As I, as I said, we have a Roche partnership. We also have partnerships with Pfizer and Metamune AstraZeneca across a variety of different therapeutic areas, which again, I think is a testament to the technology and to the team that we have. And then finally, uh, our team has over 60 years of combined experience to, in, in the design and development and then clinical R&D of viral vector gene therapeutics. So as we said, the current products have made, uh, really helped gene therapy to arrive and we're excited about all the progress, but I think to take this to the next level, we need targeted vectors, which means uh, uh, better efficacy, better safety, lower doses, optimal uh, clinical routes of delivery, and all of this should result in a better benefit for patients, broader, deeper pipelines, and uh, more optimal commercialization at lower doses and with optimal routes of administration. So how does our discovery platform work? Uh, we believe therapeutic vector evolution is a transformative discovery platform. And basically the way we think about it is the rest of the field is using one of roughly 10 naturally occurring vectors present in nature. And what we've elected to do instead is customize our vectors for the particular disease indications we want to go after. And we do that by using the power of evolution. So evolution has really two major components. One is genetic diversity. So we've created libraries of AAVs, highly novel. We have 37 independent libraries developed using different technologies. Uh, and the result is a library of over 100 million unique capsid variants. So we have 10 million times more variants to choose from than the rest of the field. So now what we do is apply natural selection for the fittest to identify the optimal vector for any particular disease population. So we define the target vector profile, whether it's IV delivery to the left ventricle or intravitreal delivery to the RPE cells of the retina. We come up with that profile and then in non-human primates, we do serial rounds of selection to identify the optimal set of vectors for that particular profile. We've now, in the first four years of our existence, completed 11 discovery programs in non-human primates. Many of these have now been characterized and shown to be uh, highly superior to the natural occurring vectors. Uh, and as you can see, lots of different tissues, many different routes of administration. So, uh, our goal has really been to lock up the best vectors for as many important tissues as possible. We've now patented uh, over 320 individual vectors and uh, over 40 families of vectors. So this is our, our current focus in terms of wholly owned therapeutic areas as well as partnered therapeutic areas. In retina, as I said, uh, we're partnered with uh, Roche. We do all the early stage development, CMC, clinical, all the way through phase two, and then Roche takes over at phase three and commercial. We think that's a great combination of our nimbleness and our expertise in this area and their uh, strength globally in ophthalmology and commercialization. Secondly, uh, in heart, we've retained all rare disease rights and we'll be developing a, a product uh, for rare diseases in the heart starting next year. And then in skeletal muscle, we've still retained uh, all rights there and we'll be filing an IND on a muscle product next year as well. So, 
you can see a, a, a nice balance between uh, partnerships and wholly owned products. We also get strong support from Cystic Fibrosis Foundation and Foundation Fighting Blindness. Those are also important partners of ours. This is the pipeline. I mentioned choroideremia. We'll be filing that, the IND for that rare disease by the end of this year. That's, again, intravitreal injection in contrast to the uh, Nightstar program. And then we have uh, additional rare diseases that are 4D products in retina, as well as muscle and heart that we'll be uh, filing next year. And again, we're, at this point, we're keeping those uh, indications confidential. This is just some example of disease, uh, some, some models we've gone after with our lead vectors. In this case, we're showing you uh, the ability to go after a, a target tissue by a route that's not feasible with the current vectors. So uh, to target the retina, uh, Spark and, and Nightstar and others have been doing subretinal injection. That's because the wild type vectors cannot target the retina after intravitreal administration. Uh, in contrast, you can see here in a non-human primate, uh, this is an in-life image of the retina at six months. Everywhere we see uh, the um, white uh, in the upper left image there, that is GFP expression in life at six months in a primate. And this is the data that got uh, Roche off the sidelines and into gene therapy. Uh, that ability to target the entire retina with a simple five-second procedure, simple, similar to what you do with Lucentis or Ilea, is really a game changer here. Our muscle programs for both heart and skeletal muscle are performed, again, in non-human primates at doses that are 10,000-fold lower than, than what uh, is being used currently with AV8 and AV9 with uh, excellent companies like uh, Audentis and Solid. Uh, we seek to target all skeletal muscle groups, uh, upper and lower extremities, uh, diaphragm, as well as uh, different regions throughout the heart. I'll just show you a little bit of data on human organotypic systems. This is on human organotypic muscle, comparing uh, our lead vectors to AV8 and AV9. You can see immunocytochemistry on the left, and you can see a dose response on the right, showing superiority of an evolved vector, a targeted vector, to the current wild-type vectors being used in, in muscle and heart. Uh, this is uh, data from non-human primates showing nice GFP staining diffusely after administration of this lead vector, uh, expressing GFP in primates. And the last little bit of data I'll show you is on cardiomyocytes. These are highly um, differentiated human cardiomyocytes with ventricular phenotype. These actually beat in culture and have a beautiful calcium flux in and out. And you can see here the 40C101, much higher uh, efficiency of uh, targeting and gene expression in these cardiomyocytes as opposed to AV1, which was used in the Celadon uh, phase three study in CHF and AV9. So I hope I've given you a sense that uh, this platform can engineer vectors that are highly optimized for efficient delivery, specificity, lower doses, and optimal routes of administration. Uh, we have a number of catalysts upcoming over the next uh, year and a half. We'll file our first IND by the end of this uh, year. We'll have two additional uh, INDs as well as clinical data during 2019. Thank you. Thanks, David. So an observation, uh, you have an abundance of big biopharma partners, and maybe I should even say mega cap biopharma partners, um, one of which uh, is known, to, known for the acquisition of bamboo uh, therapeutics. So, I mean, what do you see as the role of big biopharma um, in terms of progressing AAV gene therapy through the clinic? Why, why have you partnered so much? Yeah, I think um, the, the, the trick is to, to get the right partnerships at the right time and also retain as much uh, value for your own company to develop those products yourself and, and build value globally. So we've tried to strike that balance. I think in terms of global commercialization, you know, at some point this field needs to bring in big pharma. If, to do that in a serious way, I don't think any of the the uh, small cap to medium cap companies can do that on their own. So I think big pharma is going to play a critical role here. We're very uh, proud and excited by the, the three large pharma partnerships we have, and we think they're going to build tremendous value in these programs, particularly on the commercial, uh, global commercialization of these products. So l let's get at the technology a bit more. So, I mean, we know your vectors are evolved, but w what is it at the heart of it that makes them potentially superior to existing vectors? Can you talk a little bit more about that? 
Um, and if they prove to be as good as those big caps hope, um, could you talk about the balance on safety and toxicity in the sense that uh, your vectors are not as widely studied? How do we know that they're, they're going to be safe? Sure. So I, I'd say, first of all, if, if we think about any biologic or even small molecule today, every single one of them is almost by definition targeted, right? That's the way drugs are developed, is they're targeted. And why do we target them? Well, we should get better efficacy, better safety, because they're more selective, less off-target effects. Better dosing, should be able to use less if it's targeted. And also uh, optimal dosing regimens uh, for efficacy and convenience. So uh, there's no reason to believe that a targeted vector wouldn't give you all the same advantages. So we do have data, I didn't share it today, uh, to say that these vectors can be less pro-inflammatory and safer because they're more selective. Uh, I think I showed you their data to say that we're operating in dose levels IV that are 10,000-fold lower uh, than some of the other vectors require. And again, that should result in better cost of goods, less manufacturing burdens, and better safety because you're spraying less uh, nonspecific vector throughout the body and really targeting it to where you need it. And, and so you do have an internal pipeline as well. So could you comment on what you see as the biggest challenges uh, in AAV-based gene therapy currently? And um, uh, in addition, where you see the most innovation? What, what does the future hold? Well, I'd say, uh, again, um, I think we're, at the, uh, we're not at the end. Uh, we're not even in the middle, but we are at the end of the beginning in the words of uh, Winston Churchill. Um, so I think the first generation wave of products has shown great safety, proof of concept in a, a small number of diseases, but we have to remember that those products were by and large uh, designed in academic labs and they were designed to show clinical proof of concept in disease indications that investigators felt were low hanging fruit, where the, the barrier to entry was as low as possible. And that's outstanding progress for the field. I think to take the field to the next level and treat the 99% of other diseases in patient populations, we're going to need targeted biological agents, and that means targeted vectors. Uh, it means uh, better promoters, as uh, David and Sempromix mentioned. Uh, there's going to be innovation, I think, around superior transgene payloads and optimizing those, either shrinking them to get them in AAV or enhancing their activity. So I think it's a really exciting time, but the next wave of products and the next wave of companies is really going to be based on innovation and uh, trying to get away from 10 to 20 year old technology. And then a question on manufacturing, which is one of the big issues in terms of the pace of clinical progression. So uh, can you give a little more insight on what is good manufacturing and what should we as analysts and investors look for? So if you think about the development of novel biologics, 90% um, of the time, if you run into problems, it's with manufacturing. And that's because the process is, by definition, the product in the eyes of the FDA, meaning you have to lock in that process and the testing for that process very early on. And so you know, we at 4D felt it was important to invest in manufacturing very early on to have our own process sciences, process development, our own pilot manufacturing plant so we could do large-scale runs uh, and do tech transfer at scale. So I think really it's all about locking down an effective process early, making sure you can tech transfer at scale to the CMO to avoid some of the, the problems that we often see in that step. Uh, and then again, I think with targeted vectors, uh, we can get those doses down to much more reasonable levels and, and remove some of that manufacturing burden on the system and make it much more feasible to commercialize these products globally. Great, and, and my final question, um, what's underappreciated about your story? What, what do you hope everyone, uh, as you leave the room, will, will remember about 4D Molecular? Well, I think primarily, uh, just like everyone to know about 4D, I think we've intentionally kept the company under, under the radar a bit. We've intentionally built it through uh, quiet partnerships uh, along the way rather than doing a large uh, venture round. We intentionally built it through partnerships. And, uh, you know, but I think now we're at the point where we're ready to uh, drive a crossover round and then hopefully do an IPO early next year. So I guess that's what I'd like people to know and also understand there are a number of important catalysts in 2019 that will drive the value of the platform and the company. Great, thank you. And it's good to finally see you outside of Arvo and a lot of the scientific conferences. Um, I'm sure others have, but uh, it's good to see you for me. Thanks. Thanks, Paula.